In this section, we'll learn about the topic of chirality and how it affects a very special class of molecules called enantiomers. In order to learn about these two new topics, I actually want to start by reviewing something we've already covered, and that's the subject of isomers. We've seen isomers several different times throughout this class, and we learned that isomers are really just molecules that share the same chemical formula, yet are somehow different from each other. We saw that there's many different types of isomers. The first type of isomer that we covered are what were called structural or constitutional isomers. Structural isomers are molecules that share the same chemical formula as each other, yet their atoms are connected differently. So many times structural isomers have very little in common. For instance, they may share the same chemical formula, yet contain entirely different functional groups, and therefore they can have entirely different physical and chemical properties. Another type of isomer that we learned about were geometric isomers. Geometric isomers are more closely related to each other than structural isomers because in a geometric isomer, you're talking about molecules that have the same chemical formula and their atoms are connected in the same ways. The difference in geometric isomers is how those atoms are arranged or oriented. For example, we saw one example of geometric isomerism is cis and trans isomerism. In those examples, we saw that sometimes atoms could point up relative to a molecule, while other times they would point down. Those were examples of geometric isomers. When we talk about the topics of chirality and enantiomers, we're actually adding to our knowledge of the different types of isomers that exist. Enantiomers, in many ways, are just isomers. However, these are isomers that share not just a chemical formula, but also the same structure and the same orientation. So in the ways that structural isomers or geometric isomers differ from each other, enantiomers would be the same as each other. Still, enantiomers are molecules that somehow are different from each other. Let's talk about how a molecule can have the same chemical formula, the same structure, and the same orientation, but not be the same molecule. When it comes to enantiomers, probably the easiest way to think about these is being molecules that are non-superimposable mirror images. So the fact that they're mirror images means that they contain the same atoms in the same arrangement. But we're saying that they're non-superimposable mirror images. What does that actually mean? Well, let's take a look. In order to talk about what exactly a non-superimposable mirror image is, let's start by just talking about what a mirror image is to begin with. Whether we're talking about a simple object or a specific molecule, a mirror image means that we're looking at something exactly in reverse. So, for example, if we have this object in front of us, which has a black sphere surrounded by four other spheres, I would have a mirror image if I had this object. Now these are mirror images because they exactly reflect each other. In other words, everything lines up when you look at them. But these are examples of superimposable mirror images. Superimposing something means laying one thing on top of another. And specifically, when we lay one of these molecules on top of the other, if we can do that in a way that everything matches up, we're dealing with superimposable mirror images. So for instance, laying this molecule on top of the other one, we can see that the green spheres line up, the blue spheres are also lining up, the white sphere to the top lines up, as well as the white sphere back here. So these are mirror images, but they're superimposable mirror images. Now these differ from molecules that have non-superimposable mirror images, and here's how. Now I've made a slight change to these mirror images. I've changed them so they still have a blue sphere, a green sphere, and a white sphere, but now there's also a red sphere pointing away from each other. This now gives me a non-superimposable mirror image. First, we can tell that we're looking at mirror images because in each of these molecules, everything is reversed from the opposite molecule. But these are non-superimposable. If I wanna lay one of these on top of the other, no matter how I do it, I can't get all of these different atoms to match up. For instance, let's say I get the white colored spheres and the red colored spheres lined up. Well, now the green spheres and the blue spheres don't match. 
I can flip this around so the green spheres and the blue spheres match, but now my red spheres and white spheres don't match. No matter how I flip this molecule, no matter what orientation I try to use, I can't get these mirror images to exactly match up with each other. So, this is an example of a molecule that has a non-superimposable mirror image. Now, while you can theoretically always make up models and manipulate them to determine if a particular molecule has non-superimposable mirror images, that's not real practical in day-to-day -day chemistry. To begin with, as you've learned it during this course, many organic molecules are pretty complex, so building a molecule is kind of a handful to deal with. Instead, what most scientists do when they're trying to determine if a molecule will have enantiomers is they look for the presence of what's called a chiral center. A chiral center is an indication that a molecule will have chirality or that it'll have two enantiomers. Fortunately, chiral centers are pretty easy to recognize in molecules, especially organic molecules. That's because the most common chiral center in organic molecules is simply a tetrahedral carbon atom that has four different R groups. Or, more specifically, it's any carbon with four bonds in which those bonds go to different atoms. So as we saw in the previous example, when the center sphere, which could be a carbon atom, was connected to spheres of four different colors, we were guaranteed that we had non-superimposable mirror images. So it's pretty easy to recognize enantiomers if you know how to look for a chiral center. Let's try an example. Does the following molecule have a chiral center? Well, take a second, pause the video, and see if you can locate one or more chiral centers in this molecule. To determine if there is one or more chiral centers in a molecule, you want to consider each carbon atom individually. I'm going to start with the carbon atom on the right, which is part of the aldehyde functional group. Does this carbon qualify as a chiral center? Well, the answer is no. And the reason for that is, first of all, it's planar triangular. So this carbon, because it only has three bonds, two of them are single and one of them is a double bond, cannot be a chiral carbon because it's not a tetrahedral carbon with four single bonds. So the carbon on the right side of this molecule is not a chiral center. Let's consider the other two carbon, one at a time. If you got stumped earlier, you could pause the video again now and see if you can make a determination for each of the remaining carbons. Let's look at the carbon on the left side of the molecule now. This carbon is definitely tetrahedral, so that's part of what's required to have a chiral center. However, this tetrahedral carbon is not bonded to four different atoms or four different R groups. It's bonded to three hydrogen. As soon as any two of the bonds go to identical atoms or identical R groups, it can't be a chiral carbon. So anytime you see CH3 or CH2, we can't have a chiral carbon on our hands. So, the carbon on the very left of the molecule, as well as the carbon on the right, are not chiral. Now let's consider the carbon in the middle. Again, feel free to pause the video again if you'd like to. The carbon in the middle of this molecule is a tetrahedral carbon. But is it attached to four different atoms or four different R groups? Well, the answer is yes, it is. If I were to highlight these four different R groups, we see that one of the bonds is actually just going to a hydrogen. Another one of the single bonds goes to an OH group. A third single bond goes to the aldehyde functional group, and a fourth single bond goes to a carbon with three hydrogens attached. Each one of these is a different atom or a different R group. So for that reason, this tetrahedral carbon is a chiral carbon. Anytime a carbon is tetrahedral and it's attached to four different R groups or atoms, whether those atoms are hydrogens, nitrogens, oxygens, or whether those R groups are methyls, ethyls, propyls, and so on, as long as they're different from each other, you're guaranteed to be looking at a chiral carbon. Now here's why that's important. 
Because this particular molecule does have a chiral carbon, it means that without having to actually put together an entire three-dimensional model, I can be assured that it will have a non-superimposable mirror image. In other words, these two versions of the molecule are enantiomers. They appear to be mirror images of each other, but we can't superimpose one on the other. And you're more than welcome to borrow a model kit to prove this to yourself, but that can be really hard to convince yourself of if you can only picture it in your mind. So finding a chiral center in these relatively simple organic molecules always ensures that the particular molecule you're looking at will have enantiomers, or non-superimposable mirror images. So, why does this matter? Who cares if a molecule has a superimposable or non-superimposable mirror image? Well, as you'll see, in many, many types of biochemistry, biology, and chemistry, this particular concept can actually have huge ramifications. And we'll actually start to see that a little bit in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about terminology. We now know that enantiomers are simply molecules that have non-superimposable mirror images. And as I promised, we'll see how that affects you biologically in a few minutes. However, there are some other interesting qualities to enantiomers that affect other realms of science, other than chemistry and biochemistry. One is optics. Enantiomers tend to interact differently with very particular types of light. And for that reason, these are sometimes referred to as optical isomers. Now I'm going to give you a 60 second explanation of what this means that I promise I will not ask you any further questions about. But in case you're curious, here it goes. Most of the light around you, and by that I mean the light coming from light bulbs and the sun, is what's called randomly polarized light. The light is traveling in one direction, but it has some other qualities that are pretty random. There's a very particular type of light which is called polarized light, and that's light that has a very specific vector of travel. Again, this isn't something I'm going to ask you about, but it does have some interesting applications. For instance, polarized sunglasses tend to block out only certain polarized light. The other interesting thing about polarized light is that if you pass a beam of polarized light through a solution that contains an enantiomeric molecule, it will rotate that light. Literally, it will spin it in one direction or the other. Different enantiomers, meaning different mirror images, will spin the light in opposite directions from each other. So for this reason, you'll also hear enantiomers referred to as optical isomers. Literally, one version of the molecule will twist the light to the left, and the other will twist it to the right. It's not something you can see with the naked eye, but if we get special equipment out, we can measure it and observe it in a laboratory. Again, as promised, I won't ask you anything about that statement in this class, but it's good to know when you hear the term optical isomer. It's basically just another way of saying enantiomers. Another thing is that molecules that have one chiral center will always have two enantiomers, basically the two mirror images. And sometimes we refer to these as the left-handed and the right-handed version. And the reason I mention this is that while this is true for molecules, it becomes even more significant when we think about larger objects. The term chirality is a larger, more general term that's used for chemistry as well as other applications. So when we talk about the chirality of a substance, of a molecule, or of an object, we're talking about whether it's a left-handed or a right-handed version. Enantiomers, on the other hand, refer to this topic as it specifically applies to organic molecules. And in fact, chirality shows up in areas far more diverse than just chemistry and biochemistry. For instance, your hands are chiral, in the sense that they're non-superimposable mirror images. If you hold your hands out in front of you right now, like you're about to start clapping, the way you do at the end of all of my online lectures, I'm sure, uh, you'll notice that as you hold your hands in that way, you have mirror images. So your pinkies are opposite each other, and your thumbs are opposite each other. Now, even though they're mirror images, they're not superimposable. So if you take your left hand and try to lay it on top of your right hand so that you could superimpose them, now your pinky is where your thumb is, on both of your hands. 
So that means your hands have chirality, a left-handed and a right-handed version, or non-superimposable mirror images. There's many other examples of chirality out there as well. In man-made objects, you could think about bolts and screws, which you have to turn in one specific direction to make them tighter and the opposite direction to make them looser. If we design a bolt or a screw where the threads run in the opposite direction, it wouldn't interface with any of our existing technology. Also, in nature, there's many examples. One of the most famous are shells. As shells grow, they tend to twist or spin in either the left-handed or right-handed direction. Now, depending on the species, it might be equally likely for a shell to form either left-handedly or right-handedly, but in many, many cases, species tend to only produce one type of shell. It can be very, very rare to find shells that face in the other direction. And in fact, those shells sometimes can have added value because they're often symbolic in different cultures around the world. Plants also have chirality. There's rare types of orchid flowers that have petals that twist only in one direction, but you're probably more familiar with tendrils or vines that twist in order to help a plant climb up a structure. Depending on the species of plant, we usually see those tendrils twist in only one direction. Now there's one more really important example of chirality in nature that I'd like to show you, and that's the DNA molecule. When it comes to DNA, you probably already know that it's a double-stranded helix, and that means that it looks like a spiral. But that spiral is typically a right-handed spiral, meaning as it comes towards us and moves upward, we see it move to the right across an image. Now, even though we know that as scientists, many different editors and graphic artists don't understand this fact. So it's pretty easy to spot magazine covers and internet articles where an image of DNA has actually been flipped to show the mirror image. That left-handed DNA doesn't actually exist in our bodies. And it's interesting because even though they're mirror images, it dramatically changes the meaning of what people choose to use as an image. Now with so many different molecules out there that have significant differences between their left-handed and right-handed molecules, it's important that we have a way of designating which version we're talking about. However, which way those molecules are named depends on which field of science you're currently working in. For example, in the physical sciences, most molecules are designated just on the basis of which way they rotate plane polarized light. So for that reason, sometimes molecules have a plus or a minus, simply indicating whether they rotate light in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction. Of course, that requires an actual experiment to be done in a laboratory in order to determine the name. In the field of chemistry, instead designations are made as either R or S, which come from the Latin terms for right-handed and left-handed. And those designations come from a set of rules about the substituents on a molecule. We won't be covering those here, but it means that you can look at a molecule on paper and decide whether it's R or S. And in fact, you can actually give an R or S designation for each chiral carbon in a molecule. What we will look at in our next lecture is how the life sciences handle this nomenclature. And that's because it's the way that most biochemistry, nutrition, and health sciences will treat these molecules. In the life sciences, we use designations of D and L, again coming from terms that mean left-handed and right-handed. These rules are based on the orientation of the groups in a molecule. And we'll learn about how those designations are actually arrived at in our next lecture. So while there are different forms of nomenclature, usually you get very comfortable working with just one or maybe two, depending on your particular field of expertise. So back to the overall question here, which is why does it matter? As I alluded to earlier, even though it seems kind of trivial that a molecule can have a non-superimposable mirror image of itself, these molecules can have really important roles in biochemistry. So while enantiomers will tend to have the same physical and chemical properties in terms of boiling points, melting points, intermolecular forces, and chemical reactions, when it comes to how they interact in the human body, now we see significant differences. One of the really easy ways to understand why this is the case is just to think about twisting a bolt onto a screw with a particular type of threading you know that you can only twist it in one direction in order for the bolt to get tighter.
Well, if we take this and imagine how it works with molecules, this is going to be the case for a lot of different molecules in the human body. Only one version, either the left-handed or right-handed, will fit into the appropriate receptacle, biochemically speaking. In humans, most of the amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, tend to be L. They have L designations. And again, we'll learn what that means in our next lecture. That means that if we have an amino acid with an D designation, it won't actually interact the same way. Sugars, on the other hand, tend to have D designations. So we'll see that a sugar like glucose in the human body is actually the D form. If we put the L form into the human body, there's no guarantee that the human body will recognize it at all. Now, interestingly, there are many types of bacteria and even some types of sea life that reverse these trends. For example, bacteria and some sea life have D amino acids. And in fact, this is how penicillin, the antibiotic, works. It interferes with D amino acids. Because of that, it affects any creature that has D amino acids, but it doesn't actually do anything to human beings who tend to have L amino acids. Now there's one more area of scientific study for which the concept of chirality has huge implications, and that's the world of pharmaceutical science. Because pharmaceuticals are often just organic molecules that we put in the human body, it's possible that they have enantiomers that interact differently. And in fact, not only is this an important area of study for pharmaceutical scientists, it's also a controversial one because there's all sorts of issues here that have to revolve around how effective a medication is, the potential toxicity of its various enantiomers, and its ability to be patented. Because these are controversial topics, some of which are actually still going through the legal system, I'm not going to discuss them in a video that goes out on the public internet. But feel free to ask me about them anytime because it's a really interesting and relevant topic. Instead, let's wrap up by just summarizing what we know about chirality. The most important thing in the concept of chirality is to understand that it has very significant effects on chemical reactivity. And for our purposes and this class, the reason that we care about it is it affects our biochemistry. Now we'll see in the upcoming section that sugars are chiral molecules. And that means that carbohydrates are chiral molecules. And when we're dealing with particular versions, left-handed or right-handed, we're dealing with totally different substances. Furthermore, if you go on to Chemistry 123, you'll see that proteins are chiral, which of course is very important as well. So basically, the human body is chiral. There's many, many examples of molecules where only the left-handed or the right-handed version will actually create the effect that we need to survive. So that's where we'll end our discussion about chirality. But I can assure you it'll be coming right back up in the next section when we start to talk about carbohydrates.